thank you. Um, firstly, thank you very much to the session organisers for putting together what I think is really interesting and provocative idea for a tag session. I'm not sure, we, we wouldn't have to go far, too far back to find a time when talking about typology at TAG would have been a capital punishment. So I think it's kudos to them for, for taking it on. Um, really, the aim of this paper is, is to highlight the potential of typology as a way of integrating and understanding different strands of evidence that relate in particular to Bronze Age, <coughs> Bronze Age Britain, so from around 2400 to 800 BC. And I want to do that by building on existing frameworks and also by introducing one or two new ideas that I've been thinking about um, recently. Really, to get to grips with typology, we have to go back to probably Pitt Rivers, who coined the term typology in ethnology. The Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford is, of course, known to us all and known around the world for the typological mode of display, an approach to grouping similar objects regardless of their age or place of origin, a really important concept to grasp. Other scholars of the early 19th century, notably Augustus Williston Franks, were interested in similar ideas, and in the case of Franks, he really shaped the, the, the face or the collections of the British Museum, not just for the Bronze Age, but across space and time. And he had very similar interests and approaches. From a Bronze Age perspective, the work of the Swedish archaeologist Oscar Montelius was particularly important for applying the concepts of typology, as we've discussed in relation to Pitt Rivers, to the three-age system devised by Thompson. He subdivided the European Bronze Age further using this method, and we continue to organise um, time and material in, these type, in this typological fashion. Although, thankfully, perhaps for some, we don't continue to organise our museums in, in this type of, of very intricate and typological fashion. Although I know that some of my metalwork colleagues are very disappointed that we don't. <laughs> Really, the ideas that underpin this type of display, however, are still very much with us. And as Sorensen noted in, in a paper that's cited in the abstract for this session, these ideas, um, the, the reason why we employ typology really hasn't been, hasn't been poked or prodded or, or considered nearly enough since the introduction in the, in, the, in the 19th century of these particular ideas. The biological and Darwinian model of evolution and, and of Linnaean classification is usually evoked to explain the rationale that underpinned the type, typology and typochronology. And this makes it very easy to critique. However, the, the point I want to make is that, as Chris Gosden has pointed out, um, theo um, typology has a role in theology. In theology, typology is used to describe when a person or event in the Old Testament is seen to prefigure a type or person or thing in the New Testament. Now, if we suspend our, our disbelief or our, our lack of religious belief, what's interesting about this is that in this approach, other elements are important for what they indicate about the past, about the, about the future. So older elements are important for what they indicate about the future. And in this definition, a typological reading is one that assumes a historical framework to the transmission of ideas and critically to meaning. The idea of the old providing clues to the forms of the new, mediated by ritualised practices, beliefs and meanings, comes close to the type of, of positive reimagining of the typological approach that the likes of Chris and Mike have already discussed today. However, at the time it was introduced, typology of course lacked that mature archaeological discipline most notably an absolute chronology, but also the type of robust theoretical frameworks that many of our colleagues and predecessors have been able to put together. One result, I think, of not asking why our typologies exist has been the entrenchment of material-specific studies. And in my own area of, of Bronze Age studies, there really is still a sharp divide between those who study ceramics and those who study metalwork. For the Bronze Age Forum last year, I asked our illustrator to portray the tensions between these two groups and how we might resolve them. And in the process, I think he neatly explained the ritual killing of most Middle Bronze Age ceremonial dirks. I was only really semi-joking, but I think the division does exist and it continues to hold back our subjects. And I think what we need to do is tell more integrated stories across different materials and across different contexts. <coughs> 
How then can we get at this, this better, this improved approach? In analytical archaeology, David Clark laid out a number of useful terms and scales of analysis and concepts alongside some that are not so useful. But those that were useful, Clark identified um, and introduced the idea of the, the polythetic model that we've already heard about today from Mike. In this approach, members of groups possess a large number of the attributes shared by the group, but no single attribute is sufficient or necessary for group membership. And this is a key concept. It broke free of the monolithic groups which had dominated the subject prior to, to Clark's work. This is so important, I think, because it allows us for the first time to identify important patterns both within and between types and materials. We can start to think about what, for instance, metal and ceramic objects share, as well as what distinguishes them and holds them apart. <coughs> and we can do the same for types and classifications and, and, and actual artefacts. However, Clark's model in analytical archaeology hasn't really been brought to its logical conclusion, as, as we all know. And I think that's probably because there were several problems with his approach. I think we all know that, but I, I want to articulate a few of them. Firstly, this, the question of the problem um, of, of where clarity and meaning and definition would come from if no single attribute is necessary or essential. There's a willingness, in other words. And secondly, it has a tendency to flatten out the attributes of objects into a single frame, a single static frame, rather than allowing for the artefact or objects to have accrued their significance through a series, through time, through a series of events of, of selecting material, of making, of, of depositing, and of, of course of using. And really to address these problems, I'd like to sort of consider three key points. The first is what I've sort of... Um, jokingly in some ways called a multi-dimensional approach to the polythetic model and in this what we do is we tabulate the observations and unpack um, the different decisions made at those key points through time that I've mentioned the selection of material the production stages particularly in relation to the Chien Operatoire which we probably haven't heard nearly enough of today it's very important for getting I think at more complex and important ways of dealing with typology, but also the way that objects are use, used. So the use where of the type that people like Anne Woodward have been so good at, at, at spotting. And also, of course, the idea of, of deposition, how it's laid out, how it's deposited in the ground. I think this is important, or, or, or these different dimensions and stringing them out a bit more is so important because it comes closer really to, to a Bronze Age person or a prehistoric person's experience and viewpoint of the world, something that traditional Bronze Age typology often stubbornly refuses to engage with. I think we also need to consider how these different stages that I've outlined, the making and the using and so on, can interact and overlap. This point, this, this, this point applies to different scales, whether we're thinking about artefacts, types or whole material classes. For instance, is there a relationship, is there a relationship between the firing of pots and the casting of metal? Perhaps these things have more in common than we've been prepared to acknowledge. And finally, to embrace the historical circumstances that are implicit in the original definition of typology as coined by Pitt Rivers. How changes in typology relate to historical conditions, but also to trajectories through, through time and space. Really, the overall task is to find a productive tension between the creativity and agency that typology allows and the process and structure that it also puts in place. And I have two short, you'll be glad to hear, case studies that I'd, I'd like to, to, to show to, to, to illustrate how these points can be developed in practice. The first relates to a project that I started almost or started on as a very junior member of staff almost 10 years ago at the University of Aberdeen, and it was called the Beakers and Bodies Project. We love the alliteration, and we still do. Um, what we tried to do was to tabulate attributes and traits of the ceramics involved in these burials alongside other contextual factors, such, such as the age and the sex of the dead, their body posture, and the other grave goods that were associated with the pot in order to arrive at a series of what we called contextual types that we hoped better reflected 
Beaker people's rituals, beliefs and perspectives. We felt that this would move us away from the consideration of ceramic variability within a vacuum by considering the selection and deposition processes that took place in the funerary context. But in the process of doing that, we were really struck by the normative nature of beaker burial in the region across, across the northeast of Scotland, <coughs> especially in comparison to other regions of, of Britain at this time, and then certainly later. And this tendency towards the normative was found in other elements of the material culture of the region, particularly in the tendency of contemporary recumbent stone circles to fo follow incredibly prescribed patterns of orientation and alignment, as well as um, the fact they cropped up in the same areas as, as beaker burials. And thirdly, we noticed the, the tendency of metalwork typology to be very conservative and again, again normative in how it was created and how it was deposited and where it could be deposited. So all these things bound us together in a, in a kind of contextual and um, much wider picture of how typology was playing out at different, at different levels of social and cultural practice. That said, it was equally important for us to recognise and allow space for the absence of strong normative or typological patterning. As is the case, of course, in Stuart Needham's favourite, in, in famous as well as favourite, Fission Horizon. <laughs> the Fission Horizon in which um, what we see is a great range of different grave good options appearing um, in contrast to a more circumscribed and normative behaviour that has taken place prior to 2200 BC. And what we were looking for was really times and places where the expression of similarities are less to the fore but arguably, um, but they were arguably just as important as times when they were not. And, and this sort of tension became very important to us. However, what we noticed and what we need to go back to is the object biographies. In other words, to look at the, the chain operatoire of the beakers themselves. Because what we've noticed since undertaking this project, particularly from studying pots now in the British Museum, is that the northeast of Scotland, while superficially having pots and decoration very similar to other parts of Eastern Britain, in terms of level of skill, in the way that the likes of Sandy Budden have identified, they are actually very variable. So the pots that might look the same in Clark's volume in the northeast of Scotland to the northeast of England can actually vary very, very significantly from region to region. And this is a sort of variation that we really have to drill down on if we're going to see the differences that actually um, exist at different scales of social practice. Um, for the second case study, I want to switch um, predictably to, to metal work. Um, and just point out that a consider considerable number of Middle Bronze Age ornament hoards have been found in, in southern England. And these tend to be contain very particular combinations of objects drawn from a range of local and international object types. And lately I've become very interested in how hoards are made up of particular combinations of objects selected for deposition and how objects are structured spa spatially or composed at the point of deposition and how they relate to other contemporary spheres and contexts were happening at the same time in which they were deposited. In terms of combination, certain types of objects are associated with one another to a greater or lesser degree and there's clear patterning in this. And this situation differs by type of object and also by metal. What this slide shows is that copper alloy hoards have a very different composition, combination pattern to those of gold hoards of the same time. Um, and there's also a chronological dimension to this shift in terms of, uh, in terms of the number of artefacts. Um, it's also the case that certain types of object, objects, oh sorry, I beg your pardon, I'll start again. In terms of the number of objects, it's also clear that certain types of objects were often in balance with one another. So if we have one torque, we often have one pal stave. All this is patterning in typology, and we can interpret it in terms of um, social and regional and symbolic relationships between different peoples, groups, and regions. For instance, the Sussex loops that are found on the top left are only ever found in a very particular type, a particular region of an 18 mile radius around Brighton. So the party capital of the Bronze Age, whereas the torques are found internationally in Britain and also on the continent. So we're dealing with types that have very different regional distributions. And this is the, um, what we see in their combination is people bringing together objects that have very different connotations. Oops, wrong way. 
And I just wanted to make the point very briefly, and, 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 and Chris touched on this as well, that we also see very particular patterns in the composition of hordes. So very often they're very carefully laid out, they're nested, they're threaded and looped. And this also tells us something that goes beyond typology into how these objects were actually deposited. Um, for instance, <coughs> these arm rings were placed inside the torques and the torques were stacked on top of one another. Very particular patterning that's almost predictable in its nature. And finally, in terms of context, when we, when we chart where these objects are actually coming from, we notice that they coincide quite neatly with the introduction of early or the earliest field systems. And this tells us something about the way that objects and typology and deposition interacts with other, other contexts of life. So in this case, agriculture and economy. And these things can't be separated. So the frameworks afforded by typology and the polythetic model provides the structures we need, I think, to arrive at a way of looking at this evidence in a new way. Um, firstly, I'd, um, I'd, I'd like now just to consider some additional frameworks or ways of looking at this material. Um, I'm sorry, I'm... Um, I think I'm just going to have to leave it there. I'm sorry.